So continuing here with experiment C. So again, when you are adding emulsifier, which is a substance that enables uh, fat droplets to suspend in water in a water environment, and the result we call that an emulsion. And you're using those kind of things all the time. Milk is an emulsion. Um, your all your lotions and creams, these are all emulsions. So anyway, um, if you are doing the experiment with the fat and or the oil drops in uh, some water, uh, when you're first shaking this up, you were able to uh, generate tiny little droplets that you can see under a microscope like this. Uh, either way, with or without emulsifier, you would see small droplets under the microscope. But uh, after about 20 minutes, uh, the um, fat droplets, they start to merge in the test tube that doesn't have any emulsifier, as opposed to test tube 2, which has the emulsifier to test the droplets stay small. And after 40 minutes, it gets worse here with the um, test tube with no emulsifier. The the oil droplets they just fuse and fuse and after 60 minutes uh, you basically have just one um, fat or the oil drop it's just uh, all fused together maybe a couple are there but in the test tube number two with the emulsifier the droplets are still small so what conclusions can you make about the function of the bile salts well they work as emulsifiers and they will make sure that the droplets stay subs the oil droplets stay suspended in the water and so they create more surface area for the enzymes, the digestive enzymes, to work. So here's an image of the results that you would have seen under the microscope after about 20 minutes or so. You can clearly see that in test tube number one over here, uh, you get some larger um, fat droplets right here, oil droplets. They start to fuse together versus over here in this slide, you can see that the oil droplets are much smaller uh, on average. And it's a lot more of them as opposed to over here where the fat, the oil droplets have started to fuse. So this is a nice image of what you should have seen under the microscope if you would have been in the lab and able to look under the microscope what the effect of emulsifier is on the droplet size in a test tube um, oil and water now moving on to experiment D the digestion of fat by pancreatic juice and of course in that pancreatic juice we have that enzyme lipase that will digest our fat. So in this case, we're using extra fat milk that will be evaporated milk has about 30% fat or so. Test tube number one contains water, evaporated milk, and the litmus reagent. And we're going to add some sodium hydroxide to both test tubes to make the pH about 8 before incubation. So before incubation, the pH is about 8. Uh, test tube number two has pancreatic juice with the lipase in it, evaporated milk, and also the litmus reagent. And so um, after after adding a couple drops of sodium hydroxide, uh, the litmus color before incubation as set up in the test tubes, they're both uh, about lavender blue. It's just a very light kind of um, bluish color, lavender blue. And uh, the color of the litmus after incubation, of course, in test tube number one, we don't have any enzyme in it, so nothing's going to happen. The pH is not going to change before and after incubation, so um, we don't expect anything. But in the test tube number two, the lipase that was in the pancreatic juice digested the fat, the triglyceride to glycerol plus fatty acids, and then the release of the fatty acid uh, dropped the pH from 8 down to about 6.5, just below 7. It's a, not a very strong acid, but it's enough to shift the pH below 7, and that causes the litmus uh, color to change. It's now sort of a baby pink, um, a very light pink. I'm going to show you that on the results um, in the results um, slide. Here's a slide that shows you kind of the results as expected. Test tube number one had the water and then the evaporated milk and no enzyme that would digest anything. Uh, it may not seem that lavender bluish to you, but it's a much more bluish uh, than test tube number two. Test tube number two is over here. And that one had the um, lipase or the pancreatic juice in it. And um, here the digestion of fat by pancreatic juice and lipase here uh, digested the fats the triglycerides to 
um, to glycerol and the fatty acids. We're releasing free fatty acids and they will drop the pH, not by much, but enough to where you can see it on the litmus reagent. And so now um, my test tubes usually look a little bit more pinkish than this one here, but you can still see the color change. So this is more bluish, this is more pinkish, definitely a color change. And that's because of the release of fatty acids. So moving on to experiment E, the protein digestion, and uh, recall that the protein that we were digesting is gelatin, that is um, the coating of um, x-ray film. So this was undeveloped x-ray film, and it's just a plastic sheet that's coated with uh, gelatin. And then we're using little strips or little squares of that film um, to uh, see protein digestion as measured by the amount of clearing off of that um, the plastic backing. So test tube number one had just six milliliters of pH seven buffer, no enzyme. Therefore, we don't expect any kind of protein digestion. So it should be completely negative. Uh, test tube number two had three milliliters of pH seven buffer plus three milliliters of pepsin. Well, you do add enzyme. It's the wrong pH for this enzyme, but you might get a little bit of um, protein digestion. So I put the plus in brackets here. It depends um, from semester to semester. We get a little bit. Um, digestion here. Then in test tube number three is just pH 7 buffer and hydrochloric acid. No enzyme should give you no product. So that would be, it should be negative on the protein digestion. Test tube number four has pepsin, three milliliters, plus hydrochloric acid, three milliliters of 2% HCl, and that should give you the best results. So the protein digestion should be very good here, and you should be getting complete clearing of that protein um, coat there that's uh, coated on that plastic backing. So the plastic sheet should be completely clear. Uh, number five test tube is three milliliters of pepsin plus three milliliters of hydro, uh, sodium hydroxide. That's the wrong pH, definitely going the wrong direction. But just like test tube number two, sometimes you get a little bit of digestion because the pepsin works a little bit even at the wrong pH. And um, Test tube number six is just three milliliters of pH seven buffer and then three milliliters of uh, sodium hydroxide. No enzyme should give you no uh, digestion here of protein at all. Um, so it should be negative. What conclusions can you make about the effect of acid and base on pepsin action? Well, acid definitely helps it um, because that's where this enzyme is normally found in the stomach. And in the stomach, we have about a pH of two due to hydrochloric acid. So the optimal pH for this um, Enzyme is somewhere between two and three, so right around pH two to three. So pH two to three, Oops, that's not very nice. So two to three, something like that. Um, that's the optimal pH for this enzyme. And um, let's take a look at what that looks like in reality. So here, this came out of the, uh, the lab and was one of the results. Clearly, you can see sort of these uh, squares that those are the little um, uh, chunks of uh, photographic film there that were in the test tube. And then you can see on test tube number four that um, the protein, the gelatin is completely digested away. You only have that clear plastic backing and the protein coating is completely gone. All of the other test tubes were pretty much negative controls and they should have all gotten completely negative results. So all of the other x-ray film strips here, they should have all stayed black. Why? Number six um, had a little bit of a positive reaction. I'm not sure. It's hard to explain because there wasn't even any enzyme in that test tube. So maybe something went wrong there, but stuff like that can happen. Uh, so the take-home message here is that in test tube number four, there were the right conditions for the enzyme pepsin to work and it went to uh, this reaction here. Uh, the protein, the gelatin that was on the x-ray film um, that was completely digested away with this enzyme. The pH was right. It was uh, acidic conditions due to the addition of hydrochloric acid and we released amino acids or at least smaller peptides into solution. They came off of that plastic backing and you can see how the plastic turned clear. 
Moving on to experiment F, the action of the enzyme renin on milk. Note that this is the type of renin that has a total of three ends. So three total, two in the middle and one at the end. There's another renin that you will get to know later in the course uh, when you talk about the renin and utensin aldosterone system. And that renin is actually spelled with one N in the middle. So it's a different renin. Uh, anyway, this renin here is uh, an enzyme that's found in the gastro juice of young animals and if you've ever seen baby spit up um, the milk um, does not come out the same way it went in it doesn't look the same it looks all chunky because the uh, renin will actually do its job pretty quickly and it will sort of uh, curdle the milk and make it therefore a little bit easier to digest protein is kind of hard to digest overall and so the renin helps a little bit with the digestion of the protein. So describe on number nine, describe the action that resulted in the formation of the curd. And uh, basically what happens is that the renin converts to casein, which is the milk protein into a paracasein. And that separates the protein from the carbohydrate. So you were supposed to use non-fat milk so you don't have to bother with there's no milk uh, fat that is disturbing the reaction here. So but we want to separate the protein from the carbohydrate, so the lactose that's in the milk. And the calcium ions that are in the milk, then they, they will react with the paracasein to form that insoluble calcium paracaseinate, which is uh, what you see as the white curd or this cottage cheese yogurt type of consistency. And um, it just makes it easier for protein digestion to proceed. So that's number nine. Number 10, how do you explain the result of the Benedict's test with the whey? So the whey is that little bit of uh, liquid that forms sort of uh, when you are um, the, the solid curd or semi-solid curd and you have a little bit of liquid that forms and that contains a lot of lactose, which is milk sugar, and it has a positive Benedict's test. That's how we explain that. And number 11, of what value to the digestive process is the action of rendered on milk? Well, so it sort of prepares the milk protein um, sort of it curdles it, it sort of denatures the milk protein, makes it easier for the other enzymes, the protein digesting enzymes, these proteases, uh, to act on the milk protein for further digestion and then release of amino acids. So, and then moving on to experiment G, that was the hamburger meat experiment. And just to, to give you a heads up, um, the hamburger meat experiment, this will not be tested on the next quiz. So I'm going to combine the hamburger meat meat experiment with the next lab for testing purposes and um, so you will be tested on the um, bioenergetics lab uh, together with the hamburger meat experiment so uh, the remaining stuff all the hydrolytic reactions these uh, um, digestion reactions they deserve their own quiz it's already a lot of testable material but let's take a look um, at this here real quick in the hamburger meat experiment uh, let's write down what was in each tube so we have four test tubes. Um, the first three get hamburger meat. Uh, the last one gets water. Then uh, test tube number one also gets succinic acid and methylon blue. I abbreviated it here with SA and MB for methylon blue. Second one gets water plus methylon blue. Third one gets malonic acid, the competitive inhibitor to succinic acid and methylon blue. And then uh, the last one gets succinic acid and some methylon blue. That's a negative control here for our experiment. And um, so the then you, what you're supposed to watch for, so all your four test tubes, they're dark blue when you're first starting out. So here I did a sketch of what these test tubes should have looked like. So at the beginning, um, all test tubes have methyl and blue in them and they... Um, look all this purple dark blue color from the methylene blue. At the end, test tubes number one and two, they will completely change color and all you see is this uh, hamburger meat color here. So right here, this is the hamburger meat color right here. And test tube number three just takes longer uh, to change because malonic acid was added and that's a competitive inhibitor to the reaction. Test tube number four does not change color at all. It's a negative control. Going back up here to answer the questions, number 12, what's the substrate in this experiment? It's succinic acid. The enzyme is called succinic acid dehydrogenase. 
Uh, number 14, what's the role of the methylene blue in this experiment? It's a color indicator because methylene blue is blue when it's in, in its oxidized state. So when it's exposed to oxygen, it has no color when it is reduced. So when hydrogens are added, then it loses its color. Number 15, although the process which is occurring is called oxidation, no oxygen is used here because there's another definition for oxidation and that is the removal of hydrogen. And that's exactly what happened here. The hydrogen was removed from the succinic acid and the removal of hydrogen is also called oxidation. Um, number 16, uh, why would you expect the time for methyl and blue to change to be longer when malonic acid is added? It's because the malonic acid is a competitive inhibitor. And number 17, why did a color change occur in test suit number 2 without adding succinic acid? Well, because the succinic acid is already in the hamburger meat.